Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm your host, CEO Dan Mary Asher. We appreciate your spending some time with us today. Stopping by the podcast today is Sanford Greenberg, who will talk about his new memoir, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, inspired by big dreams and his lifelong friendship with Art Garfunkel. Greenberg has transcended his limitations to change the world and develop a passion for public service. Originally from Buffalo, New York, Sandy attended Columbia University and immediately faced a life-altering crisis. He lost his sight. With the help of his roommate and his best friend, Art Garfunkel, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa on the way to a remarkable career as an inventor and a philanthropist. In 2012, he launched End Blindness 2020, an initiative that stands to change the world and eradicate blindness. Today, Sandy is chairman of the Board of Governors of the Johns Hopkins University's Wilmer Eye Institute, the largest clinical and research enterprise in ophthalmology in the United States. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as a trustee emeritus of the Johns Hopkins University and John Hopkins School of Medicine. In our conversation, we'll talk about Sandy's incredible life and how his friendship with Art Garfunkel has shaped both of their lives. Sandy, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Dan. Great pleasure to be here. Well, let's begin with the the obvious first question, uh, with why you wrote the memoir the way you did. Uh, You're living a remarkable life, a successful life, and have impacted so many people with your work. So what inspired you uh, to do the memoir? What inspired you while you were writing? And did you write with a particular audience in mind? No, uh, yes, the audience was myself. Uh, In my junior year in college, as you mentioned, I lost my eyesight. And uh, that's when Arthur was by my side, as was my beloved wife, Sue in helping me get through those two years, junior and senior year. Uh, When I wound up at Harvard Graduate School, it was simply in me to write about those two previous years. And so I sat down by a Smith Corona typewriter and typed 40 pages. And I subsequently put them away for 40 years. And during that time, I had obviously uh, ample time for introspection And I concluded that if each of us is given this gift of life, then we are obligated to account for it. And I personally feel accounting for it in writing is uh, the best way to do it. It forces precision. And after I had concluded that the early part of this century, I was simply ready to sit down and write it. That's simple. So you arrive in New York City in 1959, a kid from Buffalo. Yes. Uh, you, don't know, you don't know anyone at first. but That's you for sure. Friends, you become friends with Art Garfunkel, who would later become half of one of the greatest uh, musical acts of all time, Simon and Garfunkel. Tell us yes. about what drew you to Art and why the two of you, in your own right, uh, became just as powerful a duo. Well, you're kind to say that. Uh, One of the great blessings of my life happened in September of 1958 when I first met Arthur, as I call him, during freshman orientation week at Columbia. And for some reason, we hit it off and we continued to talk. And one day, after a humanities class, he asked me to come over It was, I think, Amsterdam and 118th Street. And he pointed to a patch of grass. And he said to me, Sanford, look at this patch. Really look at it. See how light illuminates the beauty and colors of its complexities. And I knew that something of great importance was being granted to me. But I did not know how important that was. And we became roommates. And within a couple of years, the pact that we had created 
was tested because before we came, became roommates, we carved out a segment uh, of our lives to commit to help the other person if he was in crisis. And a couple of years later, thinking, of course, that neither of us would ever be in that situation, he came to my aid. So your, your junior year at Columbia, your life changed forever. Um, yes, sir. It was a, a misdiagnosis by a doctor, ultimately led to your losing your sight. Um, yes. What, what stands out most in your mind from that time, particularly when you go back to Buffalo, you go home to Buffalo, where your family insists that you stay? Um, yes. But you, you get a visitor there, don't you? And what, what, what transpired in that period? Uh, I had completed surgery, glaucoma surgery in Detroit, Michigan, one of the best glaucoma specialists in the country. And following that, we, my mother and I went back to Buffalo, where I lay discouraged and despondent, to say the least. And my wife... Then my girlfriend, Sue, was very supportive in terms of what I wanted to do. However, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was caught in this terrible circumstance that on the one hand, I knew I needed to go back. On the other, I knew that that was not possible. There, I had... I was a dropout at the time. I had no money. I had no eyes. And frankly, I felt I had no future. And one day, despite my protestations, Arthur flew into Buffalo and he took a walk down the street I lived on. Uh, and he was intent from the first step to try and persuade me to return to Columbia. And I was completely resistant to that idea because I could not conceive of a person in my circumstance that could make it back, live in Manhattan, and attend a very competitive university. But we strolled along and he continued to uh, persist and he joked around, and it was almost as if we were back in college, walking down college walk, enjoying life. And as we got to the end, he said, uh, Sanford, you don't understand, do you? I said, I understand. What, do, what don't you understand? He said, we made an agreement before we roomed together. Well, that we, would, that we would help each other if the other was in difficulty. I see you now in terrible pain, but you have to understand it's not only important for you to come back, although that's a decision you will have to make, but it's also important for you to come back for me. You're my best friend, aren't you? He said, I said, yes. Well, then you have to come back. He said he would do everything he could to help me. And true to his word, he did. Well, let's, let's look at this. When you, you came back, you're a young person. You yes. were going back to Columbia. Yes. But, but this, you had reached the abyss now, the challenge of going back to school, you, how are you going to read your textbooks? How are you going to take exams? How are you going to get around campus? Um, these, were, these were immense obstacles, uh, many obstacles that you had to deal with. Um, and how, did you, how did you get your arms around those challenges? Well, thanks, the Lord. Uh, 
Arthur was there for most of those issues, and he helped me deal with them. He would walk me to class, travel around the city with me. He helped me bandage my shins when I bloodied them, which was often. Repair the tape recorder I was using, this very large reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Uh, but most important, he read to me regularly. And he would come in and say, Sanford, darkness is going to read to you now. Or, Sanford, darkness is going to read from the Iliad. And I, I suppose that he meant, for me, his voice was emerging from the darkness. And frankly, that book is entitled Hello Darkness because of a friend that went beyond any measure of kindness. When you get back to New York, uh, you took an interesting subway ride. You write about it. Uh, yes. Describe the ride. Uh, most importantly, how did that ride change your life? This was a terrible experience for me. As I said, Arthur would always travel around the city with me, and he had taken me to a meeting. And after the meeting, I had to get back to Columbia. A friend of mine who was a reader, Michael Mukasey, was waiting there. It must have been around 4 o'clock, and I was downtown at 3.30 with Arthur. And he said, look, I have a sketch due tomorrow morning for uh, the Seagram building. I'm an architect student, and this is really important to my career. And I said, Arthur, I don't think you understand it. If I miss this reader, I will be doomed. There will be no more for me. And we debated for a while, and suddenly he abandoned me. And I stood there speechless and then decided I had no choice but to get back to Columbia. So I inserted myself into the rush hour crowd that swept me along to Grand Central Station. And when I got down to the bottom, it was uh, an experience that I don't wish upon anyone, being alone and blind in the New York City subway system during rush hour. So I bumped into columns and people and babies and suitcases and coffee cups and bloodied myself in the process. I was entombed in that place, profoundly feeling that there would never be any way out. So I at one point had knocked over a stroller that a uh, mother started screaming at it because I had touched her baby and I fell over the tracks. And lying on the tracks, I had hoped and prayed that the train would sever me. That would be a way out for me. And I thought about it, and I realized that I depend, I depended on many of my family and friends. And I thought, well, perhaps then they depend on me. And it was my responsibility to continue and go on with life. No excuses, get up and go. And I started walking with my arms out, continuing to bump into columns. One point I bumped into a woman's breast who was very kind. She saw me, saw my head bleeding, so she wiped off the blood and said, uh, are you okay? Uh, you seem like such a nice boy. And I thought to myself, I don't know what I am, whether I'm nice 
or not nice because the darkness had pulled me down to a very horrendous space. But I forged on and fortunately got to the Crosstown shuttle and got to the local that took me all the way to the gates of Columbia and Broadway in 116th. And as I walked through the gates, a man bumped into me. And he said, oops, excuse me, sir. It was Arthur. And for a moment, I was stunned and stood there in disbelief. But then I realized what Arthur had done for me. I had entered that subway with one Weltanschauung, and I left that subway with a totally, completely, completely different worldview. I had no more fear and no more doubt. Most important, I felt that if I could have traversed the New York City subway system blind, I could do anything. My future was limitless. That's, that's how he changed my life. And obviously he had taken a risk, um, which he didn't think was much of a risk. My girlfriend Sue thought it was terrible when she heard about it. Uh, and that conversation's been going on for decades. And about a month ago, Arthur and I taped an interview for the Today Show. And during the lengthy time we were talking with Al Roker, uh, Arthur said, you know, Sanford, maybe Sue was right. Maybe it was too risky a thing for me to have done. And I countered and said, Arthur, you liberated me. You made it possible for me to believe that I could do anything. You know, Sandy, it's interesting. We talked about this before we began the program. You know, sometimes you have an impression of, of people, um, and it turns out to be very disappointing when you, when you either meet them or you learn more about them. And um, like, like so many millions uh, of others, I um, fan, was a fan, am a fan of Simon and Garfunkel. And, you know, the impression... Garfunkel's uh, voice, you know, his, that, that sweet voice kind yes. of gave me the impression that this kind of person, not only who had a, a very nice singing voice, but also who was person, and all that you've told us here uh, today about him uh, just uh, validates uh, that, uh, that assumption. Now, I, now, at this point, you're equipped with a new mindset. There's no turning back. Among other things, you graduate Phi Beta Kappa, you're president of your class at Columbia, you earn a PhD from Harvard, you study at Oxford, and you do this all without your sight in an era before portable recording devices and streaming lectures were uh, a reality. Uh, how did your experiences inspire not only what became your entrepreneurship, but also your dedication to philanthropy and, and to public service? I suppose it started when I was in the hospital in Detroit after I went blind and my mother sat at the front of the bed. And when I came out of surgery, I, while there was pain in my eyes, it paled in comparison, in comparison with the pain I believed my mother was feeling, having just seen her eldest son go blind, his eyes cut open. I could not tolerate that pain. And I have always felt that I would rather take the pain than someone else be pained. 
and I suppose that was the, these these are lessons I learned growing up, not because they were told to me, but because I saw how my parents and grandparents operated. And since then, I've tried to do something that uh, redounds well to society. Well, you've referenced your wife, Sue. Yes. She was your, she was your high school sweetheart. Uh, you now yes. have three children, four grandchildren yeah. together. Uh, looking yes. back, uh, Sue was, was so devoted to you uh, at, at that moment, those moments uh, of your life where you were so down uh, and truly became uh, your, your support, your constant, your rock. Uh, in many ways, uh, your story is her story. Uh, can you talk about how important Sue has been to achieving uh, your dreams and, and more recently in, in managing the End Blindness campaign? Yes, I'd be pleased to do that. As you may recall from the book, I entered a new school, sixth grade, and on the first day I saw Sue, I was simply mesmerized. She was so beautiful and graceful and elegant that I simply could not get her out of my mind. This continued through sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, and she never talked to me. Because, um, very simply, I never spoke to her. And in a way, I my one-way worship of Sue found, found myself in the company of uh, the Renaissance humanist Francesco Petrarch, who wrote many sonnets to his lady Laura, eh, whom he hardly knew. Simply pathetic. However, there was a moment toward the end of eighth grade where I finally got her attention. We were in the spelling bee, and uh, the word was silhouette, and she went first and misspelled it. And then I had a critical choice. Do I spell it right and possibly embarrass her? Or do I spell it incorrectly so that I was not uh, in a position where I might brag? I decided that it was the right thing to do to spell it correctly because I knew the word. And that was the first time that Sue and I had some real conversation. We went to Bennett High School together in ninth grade, and it took me until 10th grade to muster the courage to ask her out on a date. And when she accepted, that moment in her parents' home when I picked her up transmogrified my life completely. Well, so the word silhouette means a lot to both of you. Yes, it does. Well, that's, that's a, great, a great story. And how, is, how has she been involved in the End Blindness campaign? Well, first, I think it's important to say that to ask the question which I have done frequently and in some ways has haunted me. I, I have to ask whether I might have survived the ordeal of blindness without Sue by my side, physically at times and spiritually at all times. And I've concluded there is no way, there would have been no way. Once my love for her was sparked those many decades ago, one spark on one unforgettable day, would my life have remained such a joy to live? I simply can't imagine that. And so over these decades, her having suffered 
as much as I have given the scourge of blindness, we both agreed that uh, I had been working for many decades trying to see if the science had progressed to a point where it might be reasonable or possibly reasonable to end blindness. And Sue and I talked about it for a few years. And finally, we decided on October 18th of 2012 to make an appeal to the most brilliant minds of this generation and offered a $3 million prize to the person or persons who does most to end blindness across the globe for everyone and forevermore. Well, I think it's safe to say, you know, we, you know, in our community, we talk about tikkun olam, repairing the world. Um, but it's safe to say that you've really changed the world by inventing a compressed speech machine that has changed the lives of millions of blind people, uh, creating the first global database tracking antibiotic resistance and, and in launching the End Blindness Campaign. Those are just a few examples of the work that you've done. But personally, though, what achievement are you most proud of so far? I would say that compressed speech has held a special place in my heart because of the ultimate impact it had on these many millions of blind kids. But it is insufficient. And that's why we felt that there was no choice but to end it. Because while technology, including my own compressed speech, would permit blind people to live somewhat of a better quality life, they are still at a place where 70%, according to the National Federation for the Blind, this is before the coronavirus, are unemployed. 70% of blind Americans are unemployed. I cannot begin to imagine what is the case in China or Russia or Africa or Latin America, where things are much more opaque. So my compressed speech machine started as a simple idea, born of significant frustration because I couldn't hear the words fast enough because when words are put onto a tape recorder, the rate of speed at which they go is 150 words a minute. And my sighted companions were reading at two, three, four, five hundred 500 words a minute. So it was difficult to stay up with a lot of the classwork. And so I decided that something had to be done about it. And I thought that... Uh, one had to come up with a framework to try and solve the problem. And what I thought about was the fact that for the past 50,000 years, we've been communicating principally by speaking and listening. When Gutenberg came along with the printing press, I wondered if because of our genetic and historic structures, we might be able to adapt to sound as rapidly as as the printed word. And so the fundamental question I asked, which I, and I, I entered Harvard with this question on my mind, how do you convert the mechanical energy of the voice box and larynx into electrical energy, thus speeding up the sound and doing it without distortion? Fortunately, some of my readers at Harvard were engineers, physicists, and I also met some people up at MIT. And uh, over the decade, I had studied, aside from my academic coursework, the physics of sound, and got a little basic training in engineering. And by the end of the 60s, in 1969, 
I received the patent on compression and expansion of human speech. And as you say, the thrill of it all has been to see these young kids who have an option to speed up what they are listening to and not to get that distortion. You, if you listen to Audible, uh, you can speed up the sound and listen to it with compressed speech. So while this started in the 60s, it has entered the digital age in a very positive way, in my opinion, so that it affects more than just blind people. Sandy, throughout your life, uh, you've had several notable mentors, including uh, Bill Hewitt, Hewitt Packard, and David Rockefeller. Uh, what advice have you received from either of them or from someone else uh, that has uh, stuck with you the most? That's an excellent question. A lot has stuck with me, um, but I suppose uh, David Rockefeller, we, we always had tutorials on philosophy and politics, philanthropy, finance. I'd fly up to his office every couple of months, the Chase Manhattan building, and we would simply sit there and talk about whatever was on our minds. I took years before I did any business with his bank. So the relationship started out as friendship, despite our difference in ages. And what he taught me about philanthropy is first to lead with your heart and you can't go wrong. Secondly, if you are passionate about the sciences and humanities, which I am, and which he surely was, you ought to pursue both because they are vital stepping stones to the progress of civilization. And thirdly, he said, try and find young, talented people throughout the country and provide them with financial assistance anonymously, anonymously. So if you were to ask, as you did, what is the biggest lesson I learned? It's not that I didn't learn from Bill Hewlett or Tom Watson or uh, any of the other people I was fortunate enough to get to know. Um, that, that's the most salient. And, and the advice that you give uh, to someone, a younger person who wants to forge uh, his or her own path and who might be facing uh, adversity in similar ways to you, what do you, what do you tell them? Wow. Well, I'm, I just know about this life of mine. It's, it's mine and I have been able to construct a belief system that has enabled me to weather both the good and the bad times. Uh, I guess I'd say first that one has to appreciate even the bad things in life because even the bad things are good because they're a source, of remembrance, a flavor of this life. Life is very precious. Our lives, how we live them, you can't find it any place else. And once it's gone, it is gone. That is a plea for everyone to pay attention to the Shehechianu. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us in life, sustaining us, and enabling us to reach this glorious moment. Now, bringing this down to more reality. There is a story that I'd like to share, which has profoundly affected me. Uh, Beethoven, at age 28, wrote this letter to his brothers. 
He said, today I was standing near a man and we both were a certain distance from a person who was playing the flute and I heard nothing. If there was to be another instant like that, I would end my life. He said, but I have to give forth what is in me, the art that I can give to the world. And so, and here's the key sentence, and so I endured this wretched life, truly wretched. And here is a man who suffered mightily, but produced some of the most brilliant music in history. I'm always struck by the fact that this man who we know lived what he considered to be a miserable life, wrote the Ode to Joy. The Ode to Joy. So you see, it is possible to live with both the bad things and the good things. And if you can connect yourself to this idea and accept all of life, I think when the bad times come along, you'll have a much better perspective. Well, the book is Hello Darkness, My Old Friend by Sanford Greenberg with a forward by Art Garfunkel. It's available online wherever you purchase books. Sandy, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, more importantly, thank you for these inspirational lessons uh, born of your own life, what they can teach us, how we can live our lives better, whether one has a disability or not. The lessons of inspiration here uh, and how to live one's life really are, are suited to all of us. So we're deeply appreciative uh, for your being with us today. I'm deeply appreciative to you for providing this opportunity for me. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you again. One quick housekeeping note before we conclude. Check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with everyone from kosher chefs to musicians to historians to Middle East experts. Watch our latest by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai International. Make sure you check us out. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn about our work. For my guest, Sandy Greenberg, I'm your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Talk to you again soon. Take care, everyone.